When I was younger, I was 22 or 23, I wanted to be a millionaire, you know, I, I wanted to be rich, and, and then when it actually happened, there isn't a whole lot to do other than join this sort of class of people that are less exciting than you maybe thought. Martin Shkreli is an American investor, pharmaceutical executive, and hedge fund manager who became the most hated man in America in 2015 when he obtained the drug Daraprim and increased its price from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill overnight. Last time you heard the name Martin Shkreli, it was because of a huge uproar over the young pharmaceutical CEO's decision to drastically raise the price of a life-saving drug. He defended the move by saying, if there was a company that was selling an Aston Martin at the price of a bicycle, and we buy that company and charge Toyota prices, I don't think that should be a crime. And I think that drug company can make as much money as possible. And I'm very unapologetic about that. Unrelated to the Daraprim scandal, in 2017, he was charged with securities fraud and sentenced to seven years in prison and fined a total of over $70 million. Martin comes from humble beginnings. His parents are Albanian immigrants, but he quickly ascended the world and became a multi-millionaire polymath. And despite having no formal training in medical sciences, he has a penchant for consuming medical literature from PubMed and making novel insights. You know, give me the rules and I'll play the game. We talk about how Martin does this, his philosophy around drug pricing, and whether we should think about pricing drugs in the same way that we price iPhones. We talk about Martin's new AI doctor that he just launched and the mental health impact of being the world's most hated man. I used to have two or three panic attacks a day, and I used to sit in the New York sub subway station. The room would be shaking, my heart would be eating out of its chest. I'd, I would sit down on the subway station, and people would look at me like, is this guy homeless? Is he about to detonate a bomb? What Can you fill me in on this story? It was something like there was a liver dialysis machine coming out. But traditionally, we have kidney dialysis machines, which basically replace the function of the kidneys. And someone was coming up with a liver dialysis machine. And you somehow, through going on PubMed, came to the insight that this is BS and it's not going to work and then short the stock. Can you talk me through that story? That's what I understood of it. Sure, yeah. There was a company called Vital Therapies. You know, I applaud the company for making an effort to try to save people with acute liver failure, right? That's a huge, huge problem. And by looking at this company, uh, the company did a the world a bit of a favor by proving that their approach didn't work, which, which you know, they should be applauded. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, the people in that liver failure trial died, right? So, like, it doesn't go like, yeah, we, we made money and the stock went down and we sort of like cheekily celebrating it, but it also doesn't go beyond my notice that, you know, that this is a terrible illness uh, that needs a solution. So like, I'm not the hero in the story. You know, I think that like, you know, even though I think they did kind of some things wrong, like they, they kind of knew that their device wasn't going to work, but they marshaled ahead anyway, which I think is the part that they kind of shouldn't have done. So what we saw is like they 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 tried to do this device, which reroutes to your, to your exact description. I mean, they they reroute the blood from from... I guess the portal vein or something like that, right to the to this machine, and they reroute it back. You know, so it's it's just like a dialysis machine in a lot of ways. Um, and the idea is, okay, your liver's not working, so let's let's put the liver in a box. And not a bad idea at all. I mean, it works for dialysis, it works for cardiopulmonary bypass, it works for you know plasmapheresis. It works. You know, there's a bunch of tools that work this way, right? So let's do it, right? And the problem is, the liver is like very complicated as a surface area. A uh, problem that you can't really replicate. It's vascularized, which you can't really replicate. The, the cellular machinery really has to work. Um, so, I, you know, you can't really build an organoid in a box unless it really looks and feels like a liver. You know, it has to, it can't just be like, you know, uh, a couple of liver cells. So, it has to be perfused correctly. That's why the body looks and works the way it does, and so why our organs are, are functional. So, the biggest hint that they had wasn't always on like the published literature it was actually in their own papers their own presentations where they did their first study with the box where they showed that the product didn't succeed but if they looked at a subgroup of, of patients who had either like i forgot what it was like a meld score that was too high or something like that that those patients did really well but of course this is like classical post hoc you know retroscope kind of analysis that that doesn't work it doesn't tend to replicate um you know, and that's just sort of knowing medicine and knowing statistics, knowing the history of this stuff that, you know, they, they are, they're not doing bone for Roni error correction and like stuff like that to like, you know, once, once your primary hypothesis fails, there's really no statistical inference you can make on any secondary hypothesis. And 
they did they went ahead anyway and said okay this might work and you know we did look at the history of all these liver assist devices to try to figure out you know is it possible even and i actually thought that one of the best best parts of the story could be that we started a product that that actually could work you know because this this would be a huge product you know there's tens of thousands of people who who have liver failure every year and so ultimately really important need um and somebody should take this challenge on right i mean this is like you know you know big big unmet medical need but we we made a bet basically and and you know as as sophisticators we thought the bet was we wrote a 40 page paper about it which nobody on wall street does um and this was in wall street by the way this is just me and a couple of my coworkers using our own money and um mm. we uh thought that this product would not succeed unfortunately meaning the people using the product would not live longer than the people not using the product and you know the survival here i think is like a couple months i mean if you're in in late stage kidney uh, liver failure you're not um you're you're looking at mortality very quickly so really big need it did not work the product did not work the stock went down a lot and this kind of like was a kiss of death for me in a lot of ways because there was another couple, like couple of friends we had that were also shorting the stock and again we thought the company was was being a very bad actor here we thought they were lying a lot we thought they were like manipulating people we thought they were like really glossing over the fact that their product proved to not work several times. So like, you know, we, we thought they were not good corporate actors at all. And so when the trial failed or when I put out my paper, the stock went down a lot and I did this silly photo, which this is like, takes me back to like the, do you remember this doctors and bikinis controversy that happened recently? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, social media can be so dangerous. Uh, I did took the silly photo where I um, put these sunglasses on. I, I think I put like a gold necklace on or something. I put a watch on, and I had a music video in the background of Flo Rida, who's a who's a rapper, who's uh, has a song called "It's Going Down" or something like that. And I did this like, like very like you know, tongue in cheek, you know, photo, which was like look looked like a frat bro or something like that would take, uh, and I made that my profile. And then when the Dareprim controversy happened, everyone saw my photo and said, this guy is a jerk. You know, look at this, this fool. You know, the whole point was I was dressed, trying to dress up as a fool because it was an inside joke that, you know, we had over the stock. That was the, the, the dawning of the, the term pharma bro, you know, and uh, this, this disparaging term that started with technology that there were these tech bros that were like, uh, almost like fraternity brother style want to be computer scientists want to be programmers but they really don't know much but they 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 have this like they wear the same vest they wear the same clothes and they're just sort of these tech bros that are in silicon valley so somebody saw that and said oh this is pharma bro you know <laughs> this, this is exactly that in, in pharmaceuticals can we talk a bit about how you think of pricing a drug and the philosophy behind it from what i understand commonly used pricing mechanisms in pharma or at least what people would like it to look like is basically there's one side, which is cost plus, which is, okay, here's the cost of making this drug. Let's add a little bit of margin onto this and let's put this out into the world. I think that's what most people would like the world to look like. And then there's another side, which is the value-based side, which is, I think, a philosophy that you subscribe to, which is, okay, here's this drug and here is how much value it's going to create. And this is what it's worth. And I'm going to charge this much for that drug. The context of this is, of course, the Daraprim scandal, which from what I understand is that your company acquires uh, Daraprim and overnight you increase the price by 50x. And from that, you become basically the most hated man in America. Can you fill me in on both the high level philosophy and then also the story of Daraprim as well? Sure. Yeah. And it sounds like this will be probably the first time there's a sober and rational discussion about it. And maybe that can only take place seven (laughs) years later, right? So I'll zoom out even a little bit more um, for what you asked and just say that there, there's probably at least two more pricing theories out there. One is there's just unbridled market price, right? Like, you know, it's supply and demand and th- there's an unseen hand that meets that supply and demand and equilibrium. And that's happened in pharma many times, right? Where, where there's a company that doesn't have the foresight maybe to price their product correctly and they either price it way too low or way too high. And that happens all the time. And what ends up happening, I think what a lot of people don't understand is there is a standard of care before a product comes out, right? And uh, that standard of care can sometimes be as good or 
or it's rarely better, right? Uh, but it's it could the distance between the new drug and the the old standard is is often not that big, right? So if a company comes out with a drug that's say twenty percent better than the old standard of care, but they price it at some price that the insurance companies don't feel is is warranted, it it'll turn out that nobody will use the drug, right? And and there isn't this like you know cry for you know uh, rationality or or pleading for the price dropping or something like that, you'll often see like just the drug company mess up. And this happened a little bit with Aduhelm when it came out for Alzheimer's. Like there was this, um, just this understanding that insurance said, Man, we're not going to pay for that. You know, it's not worth it. You know, why would we pay $50,000 a year for a drug that, that has almost imperceptible benefit? It just doesn't make sense. And yeah, it, it stinks for the patient with Alzheimer's that kind of wants that imperceptible benefit, right? Like I'll take any benefit I can get, but there's also this, kind of very cold-hearted rationale of like, well, if all we're doing is going back to the way it was, you know, uh, last year, you know, well, there are a million patients with Alzheimer's last year that didn't get out of home. And if there's just a million patients this year that don't get out of home, it's really no different from last year. And again, that's, uh, I think, too, too cold-hearted uh, for me. I'd love people to get even imperceptible benefits. But again, there has to be some value. I mean, for $50,000, it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, for the healthcare system. Um, so there is that kind of like, you pick a price and ultimately the market does have to decide. There isn't, there isn't this, there's this misunderstanding that like pharma can hold insurance hostage. Insurance can say no. Insurance can say your copay is 50%. You know, good luck. Um, you know, in, in that case, you you destroy demand. So I think that, that that does happen. And then price happens the other way. I mean, pharma generally will like slightly underprice their product and do price increases every year to combat inflation, which, um, you know, the prices are usually much higher. The price increases every year are usually much, much higher than inflation. But I've seen some drug companies like bump their price 10 or 20% a year. Um, we went to Pfizer for, to buy one drug and we were trying to negotiate it and they probably knew why we were going in there to buy it. So they told us they weren't going to sell us the product and they went ahead and they raised the price 50% by themselves. Um, so that's surprising that, you know, a lot of, a lot of drug companies realize drug company CEO said, well, Martin comes calling. It probably means your drug is really underpriced and you can make a bunch of money just holding on to it and, and bumping the price yourself. Um, so that happened probably about 15 or 20 times. Um, so I do think there is a market. You know, a lot of people feel that market's kind of distorted uh, by insurance kind of just accepting anything, um, which is sometimes true too. But there are cases where insurance will say no. So there is a somewhat functioning market sometimes. Um, another theory of pricing one that's really important that pharma uses quite a lot is they use sort of like similarity pricing. So they'll look at other drugs, right? And they'll just sort of say, okay, well, that drug's worth this. So why isn't my drug worth that? And that, that can be a very slippery slope problem, right? Where like we've seen like some of the targeted cancer therapies go up in price to like astronomical prices. Um, again, I, I support them in a lot of ways, but I do raise my eyebrow in other ways where I say, well, if your whole theory is you're you know, that drug's 20,000, so our drug should be at least 20,000. You know, it kind of becomes like, and, and we did that with Daraprim, by the way. Um, we looked at the hep C drug, um, Savaldi and, and Herboni and all these other hep C cures. And we said, well, hep, hepatitis C isn't, isn't nearly as bad as toxoplasmosis, right? Like toxoplasmosis can end your life immediately. Hepatitis C is, you know, is, is often has no sequelae. You know, you can live with that disease for 20, 25 years and you get a little liver cirrhosis. Of course, there are people who have neither liver replaced, but it, the median patient kind of doesn't have serious sequelae. So it's, it's not a disease you want, but it's, it's not toxoplasmosis. Um, and so we looked at that price. And was, they're $80,000. You know, we saved your life. You know, this, this, this is at least $80,000. So the price of Daraprim literally is 750 times like 100 bills that you need to survive uh, toxoplasmosis. That's literally the price of Frohane. That's, right, that's how we came up with the price. I mean, we didn't do a whole lot more analysis. We said, there's no way we can be uh, accused of having a bad price when Savaldi's, you know, the same price. And Savaldi had just come out. So like, it was still like a lot of people, quite frankly, had sticker shock over Harvoni, but Harvoni sold, was one of the best selling medicines ever. So clearly that sticker shock didn't, didn't stop people from buying and using and prescribing it. So, you know, a lot of people sort of don't understand farm pricing in, in general. I'll get to that in a minute because I want to answer your question. Value-based pricing, I think works really well because there's this sort of but for um, mechanism. Well, but for your product, the cost would be 
this for treating this patient. Um, and so, you know, I think that value-based pricing works. It's, it, it's got flaws. There's no doubt about it. It, it. it is blind to how much money went into the drug. It's blind to uh, any intellectual property. It's blind to when did the drug get made. It's blind to so many things like that. But in a lot of ways, I do think it's the fairest. Uh, I think the cost plus theory is not a bad one either. And that the sort of sum of the two probably works the best. The problem with cost plus, as you know, is it may have cost my company, say, $100 million to develop this medicine. And maybe after I make $200 million, I should drop the price to a very low price. But the problem with that is, is multifold, right? One, I mean, uh, while I may have made that drug for $100 million, there might have been 50 other companies that failed. Um, and so in sum, there has to be a net return from this industry or the industry won't be funded. So the, the, the capital that you know um, invests in that industry, say there were 10 companies all chasing that drug to make $100 million, uh, to put $100 million in, well, that's a billion dollars. And if that drug made 200 back, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cover the billion dollars that was spent. And sadly, when, when a drug is priced, it has to pay for not only that drug, but all the other drugs, because the investors that invest in this industry invest in all the companies. And sometimes they'll just invest in one company. But there is this kind of like question of like, well, if biopharma doesn't make a profit as a whole, then why invest in biopharma? And why... Why not just let this industry die? And then we'd have a big problem because we wouldn't have like the new cystic fibrosis cure from Vertex uh, Pharmaceuticals, which is you know, a wonder drug, a miracle drug that nobody ever thought could be made. But for their big gamble, their big bet on, on cystic fibrosis and this very weird small mo molecule technology they had, they were able to break the barrier that, you know, I had a friend die of cystic fibrosis. It, it, it's a miracle medicine. Uh, they deserve a huge reward, in my opinion. In fact, I, I I think they deserve a parade in Boston every year, you know, for for doing something more important than winning the NBA Finals and more important than winning the Super Bowl. That every person in in in, in at least America that has cystic fibrosis, ninety percent of the of the genotypes are now cured. Um, that's a miracle, and I think that drug company should make as much money as possible. And I'm very unapologetic about that. Um, I think that, you know, when you do something like that, you know, you are doing, and I, I'm an atheist, but you're doing God's work. And I look at companies that, again, no, no offense to these companies, they have their own visions, but I look at media companies and I say, okay, they make billions of dollars. I look at food companies and say, all right, they make billions of dollars. I look at, you know, companies in, in tobacco. I look at companies in gambling. You know, there, there's all these industries where there's plenty, plenty of wrong doing to go around and you cannot tell me that making a cure for dying person is anything but the greatest thing ever, right? I can't think of a company in, in the entire S&P 500 that is more virtuous, no matter how much they'll say they're virtuous, <laughs> that is actually more virtuous than, than Vertex Pharmaceuticals, and all they are is a drug company. But that's, that's kind of where the disconnect happens for me, that, you know, and I, I'm, I'm deeply sort of contrite, maybe even ashamed, that there's this black smear on pharma that maybe I contributed to when I, I, I wanted to remove that um, and show the glory of, of pharma that, that it can change lives and it can save lives. You know, you can argue about economic theories of value. You can argue about societal questions uh, of how do we pay for medicine. But I think that, you know, again, pharma is a, a small part of healthcare budgets. You know, which is something that I think most people don't understand. When I when I went through the Darapin fiasco, I, I talked to thousands of Americans using internet tools, and I asked them questions like, "Well, what do you think? What percentage of, of our healthcare cost is pharma?" And I'd get answers like ninety percent, fifty percent. And I said, "What if I told you it was twelve percent?" You know, they they would uh, they were like, you know, very surprised. And then I asked them questions like, "Well, how long do you think a company like Pfizer uh, gets to sell Viagra for?" And they would say something like, well, you know, what do you think? Like 20 years, you know, forever. And, you know, when I, the real answer, which is like 11 years, you know, they have 11 years to make money and then it's over. You know, everyone gets Viagra for free after that. Not to say Viagra is, you know, sort of not the world's most important medicine, but, you know, uh, pick, pick any Pfizer medicine. 
um, you know, you, you don't get forever to sell these things. So the generics come in quickly. And once the generics are in, the, the, the prices drop dramatically. And 90% of the drugs we use are generic drugs. So like, you know, eventually the Vertex products will go generic too. Do, yeah. do you think that with um, drugs, do you think they should be treated like a public good in the sense that they shouldn't be treated like a iPhone or Smarties or something? And then secondly, from what you're saying, it sounds like your point is that, look, I'm just an actor in this game that you created. If you want a world in which this is the case, then you need to change the laws or you need to change the environment. I'm just acting in this space. Is that kind of a, a fair analysis? I've learned over the years that that healthcare occupies a bit of a different place in people's minds than other products. Uh, and that this is a product category where you have to be very wise about how you establish your right to make money, whereas Apple makes more money than any company in the world. And, you know, the question of whether, whether they're quote unquote earning their their earnings is to me, again, I, I look at it very differently from others where I'm sitting there thinking like the company that's making the products that save our lives, they've deserved it. They earned it. They, they, you know, if there's anyone we should be permitting to make lots of money, it's that. Uh, because we care so much about health. And of course, people have the opposite perspective, which is, well, our health is so important, we shouldn't let people profit off of it. And, you know, that that's sort of, again, very counter to sort of the way the world works uh, in terms of like needing to pay people. For example, you, you know, you asked the other question, which ties in perfectly, is healthcare a public good? Now, there's a big difference between healthcare and pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals are the product of a person or a team's invention and risk-taking. You know, when somebody is assigned a... A, a a task in a pharmaceutical company to say work on muscular dystrophy, they are asking a team to take on the impossible task, and for the, that team to not be rewarded for their impossible task, it doesn't make sense. They won't do the job. First, they need to pay, be paid a salary, right? <laughs> That's sort of right there, uh, uh, obvious. Uh, they need to be paid uh, the laboratory equipment and, and materials and supplies. They need to be paid other resources like software. Uh, and computers to run their experiments. And uh, if they're lucky enough to have a lead, they have to then manufacture that lead, which costs millions of dollars. So ultimately, you know, if you ask for it to be a public good, well, who's going to pay for it? And, you know, the the uh, the company is paying for it uh, because they're hoping to make a profit. If the company didn't pay for it, it wouldn't happen. Universities don't have the capital to make a drug FDA approved. They're in fact, this is another thing that after talking to like hundreds or thousands of Americans, there's this big misunderstanding of like, why does there need to be drug companies? And I said, you know, there's no university that's ever gotten a drug FDA approved, not one. Um, there's no other non-drug company entity that has gotten a drug FDA approved. It's it's very laborious, very expensive, requires a set of expertise that, you know, a university doesn't have. Universities have discovered drugs, uh, but they haven't gotten them to FDA approval ever uh, or any other country's uh, regulatory approval. So to me, you know, uh, taking somebody's invention and saying that's mine that's for the public now. It's not something that's ever happened. A lot of people look at Jonas Salk, and this is maybe the one of the worst mistold stories in history. Jonas Salk didn't quote unquote patent the, the polio invention. Uh, that's because first that he didn't believe that you could patent an antigen, right? It's obvious, he said it's obvious as the sun. How do you patent the sun? Uh, well, it's a good question. For a vaccine, once you know the methodology that, that Pasteur came out with, which is inoculate the person with the antigen, you know, have you invented anything? Would it be would it surprise you that that giving part of the COVID protein to a patient results in COVID immunity? <laughs> well, we've known that for hundreds of years, right? Now, technically, there is uh you know details in that 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 you can get a patent for the specific you know idea, but generally to get a patent, you have to have some unanticipated invention. And Salk was really talking about at the time that this wasn't unanticipated. The other problem with Salk is is that the story is that what people don't realize is drug companies made polio vaccines and made a fortune. Drug companies, the only people that made polio vaccines were not Jonas Salk. Eli Lilly made Jonas Salk's polio vaccine, as did other companies, and they charged a fortune and they made a fortune. So the only actor that's willing to actually make the product is doing it for a profit incentive. Now, again, could that be different? Sure. Why not? Why doesn't Bill Gates have, have, a, have a drug company that makes drugs for free for everyone? That would be cool or at cost. Right? Why not? Um, it's it would be a huge humanitarian endeavor. It would be fantastic if he doesn't do it. Maybe the, our government should do it. Again, I have no problem with that. You know, I I I, I 
you know, give me the rules and I'll play the game. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't think of healthcare necessarily as game. I think some people look at it that way. But again, from my perspective, this is a wonderful thing when a company wants to make a, a discovery, wants to make a cure, and deserves sort of a reward for it. They deserve a hell of a more reward to me than CBS who's going to put on uh, Keeping Up with Kardashians or, you know, something like that. You know, why do they deserve billions of dollars of profit? But the company that makes a new treatment doesn't, you know, and again, I would extend it to physicians. If we want to have this fight, I would say, well, why would I go to the doctor? You know, should should uh, the doctor charge me or my insurance? Why can't I have that for free? And the, the simple answer is, you know, listen, the doctor is a smart person. And you may decide to have a different kind of career if, it, if that's going to be the, the way it works. Right. So, you know, uh, I think that, Martin, that there's this there's this line of thinking that I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you subscribe to as well, which is that pharma rightly deserves to make money and then they use that money to then invest into R&D and discover more amazing cures and treatments. And I, I linked to this paper, but it's from the BMJ from Angelus et al. And it shows that over the past two decades, revenue in pharma has been increasing quite rapidly, but R&D spend isn't really increasing at the same rate. So do you, do you think that's a bit of a myth that pharma uses its profits to basically do more good in the world? Or really, are they just kind of gouging us a bit what, what's your take on that yeah it's a great question like so i know i know i know this space better than anyone and and and, and when i was on wall street people you know consider me you know authority on pharma and new york times said i was an encyclopedia of pharmaceutical knowledge so i'm trying to absorb your question in like all the context necessary i make fun of a lot of pharma for not being good at rd um the their R and D spend and their R and D productivity are, are a bit two different things. I remember talking to the CEO of Genentech years ago, who was on the board of Apple, and I asked him how much should a drug company spend on R and D, and he had this very tongue in cheek answer, which is if it's Genentech, it's as much as possible, which was a very funny answer because he said that when Genentech spends a dollar on R and D, it gets back like a dollar twenty five. So for us, it makes sense to. If we can find projects that will give us a dollar twenty-five back, it doesn't make sense for us not to do any project. The problem with pharma is that when they do an R D project, they usually spend a dollar to get back ninety-five cents. And and that makes it difficult for them to want to do more R and D. But pharma has increasingly ec externalized its R and D. And to me that that's really kind of sad and, and and frustrating. It's hard to run a big company, you know, when you have fifty thousand people. Uh, I've never had the pleasure of doing so, but when you, when you, you know, I've certainly tangled with a lot of those CEOs, you know, it's not easy to, 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 to have the R and D division of say 20,000 people, you know, really be effective. Um, they'll make some drugs sometimes, but they're, I can't really point to others, say Johnson and Johnson, maybe one other, one or two other companies that have truly effective R and D platforms that continuously pump out great new medicine. Um, usually these drug companies will go through a dearth, like Pfizer went through a period where I don't think it made one new drug for like five or six years. So I, and it just struck out, struck out, struck out, not for one of trying, right? Like they, you know, really smart people work there, really, you know, brilliant folks. They spent billions of dollars and couldn't come up with anything. What they end up doing is they have this, their, their vision of internal and external R&D. The internal is the stuff they do in house and the external is basically the companies they buy out and they buy out companies, but they also do two other things with their capital. They do buybacks, stock buybacks, and they do um, dividends. I personally don't think they should do either until every disease has been fixed. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that's kind of a great use of, of capital. And I think the, the dirty secret in pharma is that we're actually getting very close to running out of, of new medicines to make. And I know that sounds a little strange, but there's, I wrote an essay and I think some other people have, I, I think I called mine the end of pharma or something like that. And I've been talking about this for, for a little while now, that the 90s boom of pharma where we had the Lipitors of the world, like a lot of those drugs now, well, all those drugs are generic. A lot of those drugs have established like a baseline, almost like a WHO, like essential medicines list of like now permanently free generic inventions for, for mankind. The drugs we're inventing now are for like, you know, just rare diseases that are like very large rare diseases like cystic, a couple of cancers, <clears throat> And like, what do we do next? You know, they're, they're, the mortality has dropped for so many of these illnesses that it's not really clear where pharma can go next. Alzheimer's is like probably the last big, big, big kind of target for pharma. And after that, I'm, I'm not sure what's next. You know, there's 
there's sort of like this fairly high life expectancy now in, in the US and other industrialized countries where, you know, after cancer, which is like sort of half halfway there um, with drugs like Keytruda and, and other like, you know, drugs like uh, Tegrizo for, for EGFR mutations and stuff like that, like we're getting those pretty good. Those drugs will go generic soon. You know, if, if a company figures out Alzheimer's, you know, you have a couple of spots left like Parkinson's, certainly some like type one diabetes, there's a handful of places where there still needs to be innovation, but, but there is this problem where pharma is going to come up against, you know, and people calling it now today, target saturation, which means that, you know, ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, not many people have that disease. There are about eight drugs for it, <laughs> you know, which is like, you know, is that, you know, is that really, uh, you know, what we need, you know, uh, the drug companies are starting to eat, eat themselves. Now there's still room where like GLP ones where, you know, pharma's finding a way to, to make money. And I'm not sure that they'll, they'll lose all their ways to make money, but there is that risk. So R and D in pharma is, is notoriously ineffective. They take the money they make and then buy out a drug company like Pfizer just bought Seattle genetics, really innovative, amazing company, specialists in anti antibody, uh, drug conjugates very tough technology to make an antibody and link it to a drug and make it all work together. Um, so Pfizer now has bought them, but they spent $40 billion on that. It's 40 billion they could have spent on R and D. Uh, if they were good at R and D, they do that. You know, instead they're, they said, well, these guys are good at R and D let's buy them. The problem is when you do, when you do that acquisition, you, you may get some talent, but a lot of those people will leave their stock options cashed in. They'll, they're they're They love the hunt of biotech and the excitement of it. They don't want to work at Pfizer. Right, they're going to go. Half of those people are going to go to another biotech and or start their own or something like that. And so, like that, that doesn't work either. So, if I, the pharma companies sort of have this like big block where where how do you get the innovative streak? So, when I talked to Art Levinson, he mentioned, well, there's Apple, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, and Dell at the time, uh, and IBM. Those are the the five companies. And he said, I'm on the board of one of those companies. He was close friends with Steve Jobs, and. And he said, one of those companies spends very little R on R and D, but has the most productive inventions, you know, in the industry and that's Apple and Microsoft spends a fortune on R and D, all these other companies, they, they just can't get it right. So you have to do R and D the right way. And, and getting that magic is really difficult. One of the reasons that getting that magic's close to impossible. And one of the things that I introduced to try to, to fix it, which hasn't taken hold in the drug industry was I wanted the chemists that were inventing the drugs to have a. A, a cut, basically, a 1% royalty check, almost like a music artist, on on the album they made, at the, you know, the, the molecules they discovered. And I thought that was only fair. You know, why why shouldn't the person that made, you know, the the the, the uh, Kaleidico or Cambi or, or one of the Vertex drugs, why shouldn't they have 1%? If, if it ever became the blockbuster, that person would be, would be really rich. And despite what we all want to believe about human interests, there is still a bit of financial incentive for people, especially scientists who they could go work and do something else. You know, scientists tend to find lots of things fascinating, but if a scientist gets a job offer for double the price that they, they were going to get, you know, they often think about their family and say, maybe this will be a good idea. Um, so a, a percentage royalty is something we did for a lot of our chemists at, at my first drug company. And, you know, I, I can't say that for sure that they worked harder than other drug companies, but I'll tell you that no other drug company did that because, um, you know, there's this uh, pecking order, you know, that the CEO should be the most highly paid person in the company. And I'm sitting there saying, hold on, the CEO of Merck doesn't do it. You know, the CEO of Merck shakes hands and, you know, kisses babies. The guy who's, who's sitting there trying to figure out how to make the next cure for, you know, Alzheimer's, he's doing something important. She's doing something important. And for that team to get a incentive boost of, you know, if you do your job just right and you're lucky, you guys might be billionaires. You know, that's something that's really cool to me. That's the, the team that should make the money. It shouldn't be the CEO. It shouldn't be the board of directors. It shouldn't be those guys that, you know, I basically think don't, don't do anything important. So Martin, you're, you're separating, I guess, R&D spend from R&D productivity in this sector, saying that just by spending more money, you're not necessarily going to do anything productive with it. And I wanted to just get your thoughts on something that's tangentially related of Iram's law, which is the reverse of Moore's law, which says that even though we've got more technology than ever, we're becoming less productive in uh, drug discovery. And just to add on to that, maybe we could even say that even though we're spending more than ever 
and we've got the more technology, we're becoming less and less productive in this area. Do you have like a two or three high level reasons why you think that's the case? Yeah. So in, in technology, Moore's laws work for, for not just, you know, processing power, but also sending um, a megabyte of data from me to you. Um, it's, it's worked for, um, uh, storage where storing a gigabyte has gone from costing thousands of dollars to almost nothing, you know, so why isn't healthcare getting this right? Why is, why is healthcare costs going up nonstop? Why are the number of drugs flat? So the number of new FDA approved drugs has been around 40, 30 to 40 per year since the start of the FDA, right? So the amount of medicine that has, that we have access to every year has not grown one bit. Even though our population has grown quite a lot since the start of the FDA, the global population has gone up enormously. And the cost of making a medicine has gone up enormously. So what the heck's going on? You know, why isn't the great advantage of technology making healthcare subject to Moore's law phenom phenomenons, where health is one of these goods that we have infinite marginal kind of utility and marginal demand for, right? There's nobody watching or listening to this that doesn't want a little bit more health. Nobody would say... You know, I don't need that much more health. Thanks, I'm good. But if I, I said, you know, would you want an even nicer T-shirt? A lot of people would say, listen, my T-shirt's good enough. You know, at, at some point, the clothing you wear, the food you buy, the home you live in, you know, do you want one extra bedroom? Well, maybe if you're Bill Gates, you do. But eventually, or, or Mark Cuban, let me pick on him or Donald Trump, you eventually you don't need that extra bedroom, right? Eventually, you're you're okay with the home you have. You know, but healthcare is something we can't get enough of. And I think that, there's two reasons sort of that, that why we're not getting Moore's law effects in healthcare. The first is we're not applying technology effectively enough or that technology wasn't available. The second is our insatiable demand. So I think that, you know, our insatiable demand results in a lot of kind of bad things to happen around the margin. So one of the bad, really bad things that happens around the margin, I think, is, is healthcare labor. So because of our huge demand for healthcare, at least in America, and, and it's, it's, an, it's an innate human interest, you know, so it, it is everywhere. It's just more suppressed to other places. And in, in at least in America, we have this, this, this problem where we have a very finite labor pool for healthcare, and it's a very distorted labor pool, in my opinion. And that sounds conspiratorial, but I think that there's a, like, vested interest, uh, an element within healthcare that limits the amount of, of graduates in 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 uh, the physician labor pool, and I've graphed over time how many physicians per million uh, people uh, are there in America. And it's had a very interesting, very very small kind of like it doesn't it doesn't vary very much. Um, how many physicians are there per million older people per, per million people above the age of fifty? That has actually dropped, uh, which is interesting. So you have, and those are the people that consume healthcare the most naturally. Um, so you have this like very artificially sort of limited supply pool of, of labor. And we've tried to fix that with like NPs and PAs and stuff like that to try to like bolster the physician. But what I think is happening is, at least on the doctor side, let's, it, let's get back to drug discovery in a minute. On the physician side, I think we have like this, this terribly... Um, terrible labor supply problem where we won't take doctors from other countries. We won't do telehealth in other countries. We have an AMA that's very strict about its quality ostensibly. But I think there's financial interest in that too. When you limit supply of something, at least I know enough about economics to tell you the price goes up. And um, I think that there's there's sort of a benefit to that uh, for physicians in America. I know a lot of physicians can be rolling their eyes and say, I'm not making as much money as you think I am. But I think that, you know, there is that vested interest of if we flooded the country with physicians, whether that be by easing medical school of requirements up or by allowing foreign physicians more easily to, to practice in America, I think there would be um, the fear, of course, from the physician lobby is that the quality would drop and that we'd all be sorry for it. But the counteract to that is, of course, that the price stays very high. And I think, again, only 12% of healthcare expenses are uh, pharma. You know, where's the other 88% coming from? And I think that very few people want to ask that question when you have a boogeyman that you can hit with a sick, that's named Martin Shkreli or anybody else. Um, you know, the other 88% is as much to blame, if not eight times more to blame. Uh, and in fact, I don't think, as you know, having listened to this, is I don't think pharma's to blame at all. So ultimately, that that's sort of 
uh, a big question is as to why does Moore, Moore's law apply to healthcare? Now, in terms of drug discovery itself, you know, it should be easier to discover a drug, right? Now, I think that that's probably easily dispelled by this point, which is that low-hanging fruit is easy to pick. As the fruit goes up higher, we need, you know, and sometimes logarithmically higher. It's it's not a tree. It's more of like a log scale idea that the next piece of fruit is, is 10 times harder to get. And so you look at vertex, right? You say, okay, you're telling me this 3,000 amino acid protein is messed up in the case of cystic fibrosis. How the heck am I going to fix that? Well, it's like landing a, a man on the moon or a person on the moon in a in a in a soda can. <laughs> like I don't I don't know how you do that. It's it seems impossible, right? Like I could do it with a space shuttle, but with with the soda can, that that seems crazy. But Vertex found a way to do that, and it took deep kind of breakthroughs um, in understanding to, to get there. And I think that those deep understandings kind of like, you know, they just don't come easy. They come with a lot of pain. But again, uh, you're a physician and many of your listeners are, and I want to be very careful that I don't, you know, sound like I'm anti-physician. But the biggest cost of clinical trials is the clinical trial administration period. The biggest cost of pharma RD is the clinical trial process. So... The actual discovery people, the people that do the lab work and that make the molecule, they're a percent, they're a large, they're, they're not a small cost, they're, they're, they're a large cost, but they're about 20 maybe percent of the process. The other 80% is everything that comes after. And my hope is that we can get that cost down over time. And again, I can't blame the physician for saying, if I'm going to get out of my, and I've had this conversation with hundreds of physicians in my career, if I'm going to not do my day job, which is to see a patient, and you want me to fill out all these forms and do this clinical trial, that's really hard to do. <laughs> I mean, these are not easy. You know, uh, you got to see the patient way more than you normally see a patient. You got to take out care of all these measurements and, and blood samples. You want me to do this clinical trial, I need to get paid a lot more than I normally would. If I'm going to, you know, I'd rather just go see a patient and say, you know, no thanks, I'm not doing the trial. You know, and I, I unfortunately, I, I know physicians who will say, the first thing they ask if they're presented a clinical trial is they ask two, two words, how much? You know, because why would I mess up my practice, right? I'm making this much money a month. You want me to stop doing that and help your science experiment? No, I, I need to, I'd rather keep doing what I'm doing. If I'm going to study this new HIV drug or this new hep C drug, I need to get and know how much am I getting paid to sign up just off the bat? And then how much do I get paid for every patient? Um, that comes in here. And that's reasonable. I, I, I really don't think that's a problem. But when I sign the checks to pay for clinical trials, that's where most of the money's going. And I think that it, it, there has to be a better way. Uh, some some centers will do clinical trials uh, based on merit. You know, is this drug really exciting, et cetera? But typically it's about money. You know, the more money you pay uh, to enroll a patient, the more month, the faster your trial gets enrolled. And the faster your trial gets enrolled, the faster every thing else in this big cog and wheel are, are happy. So to me, like, if we could come up with a better clinical trial infrastructure, some people are talking about decentralized clinical trials. Um, the FDA is very specific about how they want these things done, and they don't compromise. I love the FDA. I think they're, like, fantastic in terms of, and I'm kind of a libertarian, but in terms of, like, government structures that I don't think should be burned down, you know, the FDA is probably, you know, again, deserves kind of rewards and awards for, for the great job they do. They're really people who love medicine and who love pharmaceuticals and, and love studying them. And they're, they've are they called almost every drug that's come in front of them, from what I can tell, they've called it right. And, it, you know, they, they're really benevolent people. They're not like deep state people. They're like people who love medicine. You know, when, it, when a new cancer drug comes out that's saving lives, they'll approve it in three months. When new diabetes drug comes out that is the 43rd type 2 drug, you know, they'll, they'll take 18 months because they, that's what they should do, right? And I think- So Martin, like, one, one of your solutions for this rising physician cost thing is creating Dr. Gupta, like a GPT physician. I was really curious about this in the sense that is this like a cool toy that you've put out? Is this a serious thing that are putting out into the world? And how have you thought about it from first principles that is this something that's going to work in the next decade even? Yeah. So drdupta.ai, that's our, our website. I have to plug it for a second. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> the, the, uh, it is the start of what I think is going to be very important. Yes, and this is my full-time job. Um, you know, I have a software company. 
that that's focused on this. Uh, Dr. Gupta is our main product. I think that in 50 years, and take that number with a for large standard deviation, I don't think we'll have physicians anymore. I think our children will ask us what it was like to, to talk to a doctor, um, and they'll be curious, and, and it'll probably be no different from the way we might ask our grandparents or something like that, you know, what was it like to do something in your time? What was it like to, to be in a horse and carriage? I think the answer there comes from, from computing technology, right? It's not just AI. It's, it's this explosion of information. If you're a physician who is, let's say, a neurologist, can you really honestly keep up with every paper and every academic meeting in neurology? I, I, the best doctors I know are, are truthfully say that they can't, that it's very, very hard to treat uh, patients and then also uh, become an expert in everything in neurology. Uh, again, for my pecan disease, you know, this is something most neurologists don't know a lot about, and I don't blame them. It's it's extremely rare. There's there's hundreds of neurological diseases. Can you really master all of them? No. Uh, should you? Probably not. You know, this is the physician's job has become impossible uh, due to this explosion. There are now 38 million articles in PubMed, uh, a couple million added every year. It used to be a couple hundred thousand added a year. You know, the scientific and medical uh, knowledge has exploded so much that you know being a doc is is really awfully difficult and. You know, uh, can you remember everything from med school? Are there going to be days where you have bad days? Are there going to be times when you're burnt out and you want to quit? Are there going to be times where you wish you could see 10 patients today, but you have to see 1,000 or, or sorry, like 100 or 200? You know, uh, are there times where you wish you could spend an hour more with your patients, but you also have to spend an hour with your family? It's really hard. You're human. It's limiting. It's, 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 it's necessarily limiting. If there were a machine that could do it, which up until now, there I would say there's no chance, right? A doctor's job is very, very, very difficult. Uh, it takes training for a reason. If there's even a part of that job that could be done by a machine, I'd be impressed. Well, I'm impressed. <laughs> you know, there I do think that, and I think many other people are too. You know, uh, a group from OpenAI and and Microsoft put out a paper in the New England Journal, which I never, I never thought those words would come out of my mouth. That Microsoft would be publishing in the New England Journal, but they did. And every, you know, everyone's been talking about it. I know physicians who use OpenAI's ChatGPT every day, um, you know, instead of using Google every day. And I think that this miracle, if you haven't spent time on ChatGPT, forget my website, just go to ChatGPT and ask medical questions. You're in for a treat. These, these products, as you know, uh, are scoring equivalent to good doctors on MLE exams. Um, MLE exam is not all you need to be a good doctor, of course, but uh, I do think that there's some percentage of the physician's job that can now be automated. And that's something that's a little scary to some people. You might call them Luddites or anti-progressives or conservatives. But I think that, you know, we have to accept technology and we have to use it to, to improve the world. Yeah, I, I got an email from uh, an Iranian uh, group uh, yesterday who said that Iran is, is, has rural areas that are very poor and we'd like to take Dr. Gupta and, and apply it to huge parts of Iran that don't have medical expertise. I mean, these people will have almost no options for healthcare. Um, it, it, at least that's any good. Uh, and we think your product would be, would be incredible for, for a big chunk of Iran. And, you know, some of the people that have, have come to me and said, uh, we've gotten overwhelmingly positive responses, including from physicians, you know, 80, 90% of the pe physicians we've talked to think this is wonderful, you know, but the 10 or so percent probably don't realize that there, there are lots of people in the world that, that don't have access to healthcare, including in America and including in Canada and including in the UK. There's poor parts of those countries too. Uh, and there's places where there aren't good doctors too. And if you want the very best specialist in, in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or something like that, you know, he's probably not going to be on your block. He's probably not going to be in your metropolitan area. She She's probably going to be somewhere else. Charlotte Dravé discovered Dravé syndrome. She doesn't live here. I can't talk to her. You know, but if I can talk to a machine that's embodied most of the knowledge that, that she's written, you know, maybe that's good enough. Maybe that's uh, a good start. You know, uh, maybe that's at least informative for a physician or a healthcare worker or a patient to read about and, and, and move forward. And I think that these trillions of dollars we spend on healthcare, something has to give. America's going bankrupt, which our politicians seem to ignore. Uh, we spend trillions of dollars more than we take in for uh, tax revenue. And we spend it on healthcare, and I think we should spend it on healthcare. In fact, I think we're going to spend more of it on healthcare because we demand that. But who's going to pay? And a lot of that money we're spending is is sort of being spent on 
wasteful physician interactions, wasteful uh, interactions with healthcare providers that are not particularly pleasant. When you talk to, when you go get a doctor's appointment here, you're sitting in a in doctor's office for an hour. Uh, then you're shuttled around. You talk to NPs and PAs for 10 minutes. And you see the doctor for 90 seconds. And the doctor's trying to make that 89 seconds. It feels like at least the doctor's trying to make it 85 seconds. How can I shave off any time spent with this person? Um, you know, so I, I think about the person, you know, uh, in in uh, the Bronx over here that is uh, Spanish as a first language, finding a patient doctor who will answer all your questions in your native language. I'm not surprised that minorities utilize healthcare less than 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 English first speakers and people who are making lots of money. I'm not surprised at all. Um, I've seen it in my own family. And so, making a tool that equalizes the access to inf healthcare information, of course, not treatment. Doctor Gupta can't treat you. He can't write a prescription. He can't perform surgery on you. Uh, but he is a healthcare simulation of of a doctor. And when you enter Doctor Gupta, you have to acknowledge we can't. We do. We actually don't let you use the service. Until you acknowledge, you understand it's not a real physician. And I think a lot of people sort of have that mixed up. Uh, not a lot, you know. Again, we have, we've had, you know, we're on pace to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of users this month, and um, you know, all all satisfied. Nobody said Dr. Gupta got got it wrong. Nobody said Dr. Gupta told me to take an antibiotic when, when I had high blood pressure or something. But you know, Martin, what's the is the approach here to put like an AI doc? let it loose on the world because it's effectively a medical device, right? Even if they're not performing any treatment. I dispute that very quickly, but go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I'm curious then. So is it, my understanding was that a medical device is anything that's, um, I guess it differs between the Europe and the FDA, but it's basically something that has an impact on a patient's care. That was my understanding, but is is this not a medical device yeah, if it's giving medical it's advice? It's not a medical device, that's for sure. Uh, and if if that, the FDA said as much, right? if, if, the, if it were oh, really? a medical device, if it were, yeah, if uh, the FDA commissioner said, they didn't tell us, I'm, I'm reading the FDA commissioner's public statements that on OpenAI, for instance, you know, we're, we're a small, you know, tiny piece of this, right? I mean, we're a startup with five people, you know, we're not uh, OpenAI. You go to ChatGPT, it, it'll give you medical, you know, it'll give you medical advice. It's, it's clear, you know, they, they take all the same disclaimers we do, uh, but they have 100 million people that use our product. We have 50,000 people that use our product. I'm sure we'll grow to millions of people. But the point is that we live in a new world where regulation has to get around and think about AI in general. And it has to do that with a careful hand. If And that's what the FDA commissioner, if you read his comments, he was, he was I think, very sharp about how to do this. You don't want to take a sledgehammer to this promising new technology, right? That would be a big, big, big mistake, and and you would allow economic growth in every other country other than the U.S. And trust me, it would take me thirty seconds to ban the United States from Dr. Gupta, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't like it, but I I press that button if that was what was asked. And every other country in the world would have access to Dr. Gupta except America. Does that make a lot of sense? I don't think so. Um, and if Germany or, or the U.K. said, you know, this is a medical device, you got to register, et cetera, et cetera, it's okay, no problem. Click, you know, um, you know that this, you know, and and I'd also say, hey, by the way. Make OpenAI do that too, because you know they're they're the same. We're basically the same product. Um, we just take their product and wrap it in a, in a different bow. Um, it's a better bow, and I could explain the technology why we give actually better answers than OpenAI's product. Which I love them; they're great. Uh, they're our partner, but you know we we tweak the technology quite a bit to make it better. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, but can, I, can I ask, because I think when using yeah. ChatGPT, the two issues that I saw in terms of the context of giving medical advice were one, the hallucinations issue where it makes up incredibly convincing information, but it's just fabricated. And then secondly, one of the big issues of it was that you don't get the source data or where is it getting this from? Because if it could tell you that, okay, here's my recommendation, here's the uh, AMA guidance or whatever, then I'm that's legit. So is, is Dr. Gupta tackling any of those two? Yeah, yeah, so I'm so happy you mentioned that. So hallucinations have dropped with GPT-4. GPT-4 is very expensive and it's very slow. So we still use GPT-4, but it's, it's something that um, hopefully technology will improve. Hallucinations are down like 95% with that. We think we reduce hallucinations 99.9%. .9%. We use a tool called introspection, which is an approach that, you know, I, I stumbled upon very early on in my own uh, playing with this stuff. I've been playing with GPT since GPT-2. Uh, I created a, a library called BookGen, which tries to write a novel from scratch using GPT. 
and it does a terrible, terrible job until I stumbled upon this idea of introspection, which is, I want you to read what you just wrote and tell me how you would fix it. And what's remarkable about this is that the book quality jumped up dramatically. Again, it's not Dostoevsky just yet, but it was, a, it was able to take its former writing and say, hold on a second, I would have adjusted this and I'm just that and so forth. I said, well, maybe do it again. <laughs> you know? and, and, and slowly you kind of got this like remarkable self-improvement. And on all kinds of tests, like standardized tests, this reflection approach, intr introspection and reflection, some people call it uh, uh, actor critic or critic actor. This seems to improve the results dramatically. Um, Dr. Gupta is is a bit slower than ChatGPT for this reason. It's not a lot slower. It's like, it's like another ten, five or ten seconds than what you would expect from GPT, ChatGPT. But what we're doing in the background is we're firing off like a dozen different s screening and like analysis requests of of what. Gupta wants to say and making sure that it makes sense and making sure that it's not hallucinating and making sure that it's it's solid through a couple of different lenses. It's not going to ever be perfect, right? And I think that's why our disclaimers exist, right? We're not advertising that this can diagnose you. We're not advertising that this can treat you because it can't. Uh, we're advertising that this is a healthcare information tool. It's like Google, but a lot better presentation. Um, and Googling is not a medical device. Going to WebMD is not a medical device. Um, if you read an article on WebMD, they don't have to register that article at the FDA. Uh, some people maybe think they should. Uh, GPT is a search engine. You know, that's really all it is. So in terms of sources, um, LLMs are completely inscrutable, right? They have these trillions of weights and the calculations that are done to go from your query to an answer are, are, are inscrutable even to the companies that, that, that make them. So what we've tried to do, and that we'll be rolling this out, I think on Monday or Tuesday, is we're going to have the, again, sort of first ever product where if you talk to Dr. Gupta and you said, I, I have a stomach ache, it feels in the lower part of my abdomen, et cetera, et cetera, and you keep kind of conversing, and he usually will ask you a bunch of questions like, well, um, have you been eating something different lately, or are you traveling, and so forth, and, and ChatGPT doesn't do any of that right now. ChatGPT just kind of like spits out an answer, whereas Gupta wants to like engage with you and take a history. Um, you know, GPT just sort of says, well, there's a lot of causes for stomach ache. Here's six of them. And and it's a very smart answer. You know, it's it's a good answer, but it's, it, it doesn't have any citations or sources or, or anything like that. So our system, at least in a couple of days, I, I you might have seen a figure lurking around here. We, we've cooked up this demo over the last 48 hours. We've been in this room. Uh, instead of partying in New York City, um, and the uh, um, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, just working our butt off. Um, I woke up to to this this guy hasn't been sleeping. We're programming the system where you're going to get citations, and all the citations will be in a like a box that Gupta will provide. And I think like when you see a doctor, we all know that the doctor went to medical school. We all the doctors responsible, but you also don't get a stack of references when you, when you see your position. You know, what he says, you know, I'm going to give you this drug called uh, a sumatriptan. Um, you know, he doesn't say, well, here's 20 papers on sumatriptan. Um, Dr. Gupta will do that starting, you know, in a couple of days where where there'll be that citation list. Um, how do we get it to the point where we can confidently say Dr. Gupta's actually read, digested, and crystallized every paper? I'm working on that as well. It's a different problem. And what we found is that these LLMs seem to contain all this knowledge anyway. And I was like very like distraught because I wanted to make like, uh, and a, a physician would truly understand this, like Broca's area in our brain is like the process, the area that's important for speech processing. When you have a stroke injury or like a physical injury to Broca's area, you lose the ability to speak. LLMs to me are like Broca's area, but we have the rest of the brain other than Broca's area for a reason. And there's other parts of the brain that do things like real thinking, real agency, real planning, um, and uh, the whole prefrontal cortex. So we need, in AI, we need a prefrontal cortex um, before these tools can really be as, as dramatic as we would hope. It's like I'm saying 50 years from now, uh, that there'll be no physicians. Um, we're not even close to that yet. So I'm trying to figure out, like, where do we get, like, I joked, our, our codename for it is Corpus Callosum, where, like, we, we, we traverse this idea of, like, Part of these machines should have structured 
explainable traditional database data. And the other part is this LLM that's like a black box. And like, do we want to like make this connection back and forth? And like, we've done a lot of this types of programming before um, with LLMs. And the, 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 the hard part is that the LLM seems to be as good or better without it. Um, and coaxing it to explaining its answer is something that I think JPT is making a lot of progress on. Um, so we're just trying to sort of get that sense. If you ask Dr. Gupta about Monjuro, for instance, it doesn't know that drug because it just came out. Um, so like, that's a big gap. Like we want people to be able to get the most up-to-date information. Um, so how do we implement that is, is another big question. So there's a lot of like architectural issues that, that, you know, we have to improve upon. Awesome. Can, I, can I finish off by asking two quick, cheap questions, which are, can you just go quickly go over the mental health impact of being Martin Shkreli and at once being the world's most, or the country's most hated man? And secondly, how rich are you? Because I was, you seem to have done really well in life and then you've got this tens of million of dollar fine. Um, so I, I have no concept of that. So if you're comfortable answering, I'd be really interested to know. Sure. So uh, I guess in the first question, I grew up with, uh, I, I had my first symptoms of panic disorder um, in my early teens. Um, and I had other, you know, issues like depression and stuff like that. But, you know, I had sort of like this anxiety panic attack disorder that um, I started getting treatment for in, or was about 17 or 18. Uh, I started using venlafaxine. And Part of my love for medicine and love for for pharma and so forth was that that product saved my life and that doctor saved my life and I still owe everything to 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 Doctor Saltiel here in New York and um and the people that made venlafaxine because I used to have two or three panic attacks a day and I used to sit in the New York sub subway station the room would be shaking my heart would be beating out of its chest, I'd, I would sit down on the subway station and people would look at me like, is this guy homeless? Is he about to detonate a bomb? Like, what, what is this guy doing? And I couldn't, I really like couldn't move. It was so scary. And I took this drug and it all went away. And it was like, I know that that's a lucky case. You know, uh, that's a really lucky win. But that miracle for me was like, wow, I love this doctor and I, I love this medicine. And some people have that experience with medicine. Some people have the opposite experience with medicine, right? Where they take a drug and they feel like it really hurt them or something like that. So so that sort of happened with me. As sort of this strange life I've led sort of has continued, it, it hasn't been strange just because of Daraprim, right? Like I uh, had a very tumultuous high school experience where I both was like dropping out and far behind, but I also finished school early and I went to college early and then I worked at the hedge fund early and I was working in this, you know, big time Wall Street thing at a very young age. Uh, so there was always this like, weird life that wasn't exactly normal for me. And so starting my own fund, starting my own uh, drug company, taking that public at 28 or 29, uh, being a millionaire, very young, um, all the tumult that comes with that, um, you know, certainly, you know, getting indicted, um, going through the Daraprim experience wasn't pleasant. All of that stuff is sort of like just a, you know, it's a, I, I guess like a, a combination that you know, it's an interesting tapestry of, of life. The mental health part, I'd say in general, like, you know, it, it, it can be very depressing. It can be very frustrating. There's all kinds of emotions. I'm very lucky that, you know, I have some resiliency. I'm not neurotic um, where there are people that if they ran out of mayonnaise, it's the worst day of their life. You know, I'm not that kind of person. I'm, I'm, I'm very resilient, almost stoic. Um, I think that's benefited me to a large part. I've had, I have a huge, huge fan base, as, as you may be aware. Some of the biggest people in Silicon Valley in politics and culture are friends of mine at this point. And in untold people who I started YouTubing and I started podcasting and people said, gee, you know, I actually kind of like this guy and he's not what the media made, made them out to be. Some people see it and say, you know, I still don't like this guy and that's okay. You know, um, I think ultimately, you know, you can't make everyone happy. And I think that, you know, I, I, I know that the choices I've made in my life are, are, I think the right ones. Um, yeah, I have made every choice perfectly like anybody else, but I think that, you know, when you have that kind of inner peace, I think it, it helps a lot, you know, in terms of wealth, you know, I've, I'm going through some interesting litigation <laughs> that, you know, is subject to appeal and, 
uh, all kinds of like guarantees and indemnities. So I, I'm not too worried about uh, the recent litigation. So I'm still a very wealthy person, but ultimately, um, you know, if if I could decide whether or not, like math is one of the things I love. If I could prove a math theorem uh, that would have my name on it for the rest of time, or have all the money I've ever made and all the money I ever will make taken away, I would take the math theorem without a you know, second of thought because, you know, being rich is is not what it's cracked up to be. You know, Warren Buffett says it all the time. You know, I sleep in the same bed as 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 you do. I sleep. I I hopefully not the exact same, but I I eat the same hamburger that that you do. I, you know, there there are very few things that that are are more comfortable for me than you, just because I'm I'm and he's literally the, was the world's richest man or is, and I think like. The, the the time you spend with your family, right? The the scientific challenges you 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 work on. Those those are fun for me. When I'm programming a computer, I'm having fun. You know, when when there's a big party in New York the other night that I missed that everyone was trying to drag me out to, and I had to work on Doctor Gupta, and that was ten times more fun for me than than going out to this party that was supposed to be great and this and that. And you know, I'm I'm not. That's not what I do. You know, I I I put me anywhere in God's green earth with a computer and internet connection. I, I'm gonna have a great time. Sure, I'll, I'll make ends meet financially, and you know I'll find people like me that that want to do stuff like that. And I think like the really wealthiest people are the people that have good friends, good family, good peace of mind. They they're not chasing the next thing. When I was younger, I was twenty two or twenty three. I wanted to be a millionaire. You know, I I wanted to be rich. And and then when it actually happened, you know, there there what there isn't a whole lot to do other than join this sort of class of people that that are, that are less exciting than you maybe thought they were. And and you know, the people I really like to be around are, are scientists, uh, programmers, physicians, people who straddle a couple of those things. You know, those are those are the most exciting people to me. So the people, like people won't remember who Steve Ballmer was, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, uh, from now. But people do remember, uh, you know, some of the early physicians. People do will remember uh, some of the people like Pastor or, or some of the people uh, who made huge, like Jennifer, Jen, Jennifer Duna, right? I mean, she'll be remembered probably 100 years from now. Whereas the average billionaire business person probably not even remembered right now, <laughs> you know, 100 years from now. So, you know, to the extent that that's a metric of importance, I think like, you know, it, it, it's really relevant. Now, you may you may be able to have a, a big, you know, house or something like that, but I, I just don't listen. I, I'll take all the money that comes my way. But, you know, that uh, there's a plaque in the background there of of, uh, of U.S. patent I got. Um, you can see that if you if you look around my place, it's empty. It's, you know, there's pretty much minimalist. But that that one little plaque, I'm really proud of making that invention of the phosphoramidate, you know, prodrug. You know, those are the kinds of things I live for. You know, and and sometimes they require money, sometimes they don't. But ultimately, whether I have fifty million, a hundred million, two million, zero million, you know, it's you know, it's 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 to me like I I also have a lot of faith. I think a lot of wealthy people don't have faith that they can make money, so they kind of like you know get very very like protective of it. Um, for me, I, I have no doubt like I can make a billion dollar new business very quickly. Um, very quickly is not overnight, of course. It takes years, but I have a talent that, that sort of can't be taken away from me and a passion that can't be taken away from me. I hope you enjoyed that episode. You can find all my links by going to bigpicturemedicine.co.uk. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, then please consider leaving a review. And by the way, all of these episodes are now available on Spotify and on YouTube in video format. Thanks for listening.